why could we try to save the world as scientists? I mean, basically now we're talking about super intelligent systems sometime in the future that would be used to simulate the world and save it and so on. But you know, officially, at least so far, our brains are still superior to all those supercomputers. So basically, given the flexibility of your brain that you can learn to function in different ways and uh, you can basically teach it uh, to simulate the world <laughs> in a sense, right? And uh, from this, uh, learn a lot about what can be done to improve the state of the world. Now, more about this actually during my evening lecture. So this is about global system science over we'll here. And we know the problems of the world are complex. We're faced with climate change, with the financial, economic, and spending crisis, with conflicts and wars and mass migration and terrorism and all of that seems somehow to be related to one fundamental problem which is lack of sustainability so we are overusing the resources of this planet and that creates scarcity of resources elsewhere and all of those problems are they're coming closer and closer so Basically, if you want to live in a better future, we need to get this problem fixed over here, right? That's kind of one of the most fundamental problems and CO2 is just kind of a small part of this thing, global warming. So we have to talk about complex systems and I assume that you've learned a lot uh, from Hans Hermann and others about complex systems such as his beautiful Mandelbrot sets and Lorentz attractors and uh, bifurcation diagrams and all this um, so I won't spend much time on those things um, I assume you know all that already but just a very quick summary it's important to distinguish between complex and complicated systems so complicated systems are systems such as cars made up of many components but they're basically in their fixed place. They do what you want them to do and you can control the resulting complicated system usually quite well. So you have a steering wheel and a gas pedal and a brake and the car will usually do what you want it to do. But traffic flow based on the interaction of many cars will actually behave in a complex and in many ways unpredictable way and this is a complex system such as the evolution of weather and we know that there are limitations basically to predictability because of that there are physical phenomena behind it such as turbulence and small changes in the initial condition would eventually give uh, very different outcomes and the world of course altogether is quite complex financial markets uh, for example and so we cannot expect the future to be predictable nor can we expect to the, the world to be controllable just take this very simple experiment of drivers driving in a circle it shouldn't be a difficult task actually all of those drivers have good education a driver's license uh, they have the very best intentions to avoid traffic jams they have all the data it seems they need to drive in a smooth way and they have very good technology but as you can see just the opposite of, of, of what all those drivers would like to happen is actually <coughs> happening sorry for this that means we do have this uh, traffic jam that emerges here small variations in the speeds and distances are being amplified and there is a domino effect basically or cascading effect that eventually leads to this stop and go traffic right and we call that systemic instability and that's something very important to understand if you want to improve the state of the world so at one point in time basically when we had uh, finished the pilot of the future ICT project 
we came up with this paper about global system science in nature. Globally networked risk and how to respond. And um, it basically starts by saying humans have created tightly connected systems in network risk, which has led to a world we do not understand and cannot control well. Systemic risk and extreme events are consequences of this. However, systemic instabilities can be understood by a change of perspective from a component oriented to, to an interaction and network oriented view. This also entails a fundamental change in the design and management of complex dynamical systems. Establishing a global system science will allow us to better understand our information society with its close co-evolution of information and communication technology and society. This effort is allied with the earth system science that now provides the prevailing approach to studying physics, chemistry and biology of our planet. And basically global system science is the science of global systems, but it's also system science scaled up to global scale. What is really important is to realize that linear thinking fails. And that includes top-down control and supply chains and hierarchies as we know it. And instead, we have a network world with feedback, sight and cascading effects rather than the intended effects in many cases. An effect Many problems in the world result from systemic instabilities. So stop and go traffic is just one example. Crowd disasters is another example. Not always do people self-organize so nicely as you can see it over here where we have the information phenomenon. Um, when densities get too high, basically order in the crowd can break down and people may be killed even though nobody wants this to happen. Uh, we might have instable supply chains, even managers would have difficulties actually as we can experience in the so-called beer game, a simplified supply chain. But the entire thing also happens on global scales where we have booms and recessions and we see also systemic instability when it comes to crime. You see those oscillations over here, so certainly no equilibrium system. And then there are these tragedies of the commons, such as overfishing, right? Here, cooperation would be desirable for the system, would be good for everyone, but it breaks down because cooperation under these conditions is unstable, such as the smooth circular traffic flow was unstable. And that's why it breaks down and we end up with outcomes that we don't like, those tra so-called tragedies of the commons. Or conflicts can be the result of systemic instabilities, you know, both on the large scale when we're talking about the relationships between countries, but also on the small scale. That's how people get divorced, basically. You know, it's usually not an intention, but a certain dynamic sets in that gets out of control, right? Systemic instability again. Same thing with revolutions, or also these kinds of cascading effects. So, very simple system that you can build at home. Nice for a rainy weekend. And as you can see here, uh, local perturbation can actually mess up the entire system through a cascading effect. And actually, this is not just theory and it's not just a funny experiment. This is happening in the real world. For example, during the financial crisis, where Lehman Brothers got bankrupt and we had a cascade of bankruptcies that ended up with losses of hundreds of billions of dollars that somebody has to pay for, right? This shouldn't happen. So if you want to improve the world, fix those systems with your knowledge of complex systems, right? Now, 
as you know, it takes some time to learn about complex systems and um, people would like to make things more simple and that's why they try basically to, to solve problems with data science and artificial intelligence. Now we have a situation where in just one minute 700,000 Google queries are being sent by people and 500,000 Facebook posts. And as you go shopping, as you move around, you leave digital traces and all those traces are being collected and that altogether creates basically something that we call big data. And this big data is now being fed into artificial intelligence systems. And some people think that in a couple of years we'll have super intelligent systems that would obviously be more intelligent than people. And uh, some people think that military may already have such kind of super intelligent system. So basically the idea comes up, uh, just collect as much data as you can get and feed it into the super e AI systems, super intelligent systems and let them learn how the world works and how to improve it or look for the optimal solution within the set of solutions that you find throughout the world and then implement that everywhere basically and run society like a giant machine and that's the idea of those people who say we have automated production we're automating self-driving cars and so why shouldn't we automate cities and nations and the entire planet and that's why I've written this book over here which is divided in two parts and the first part is how people think we should run the world using big data and AI in a centralized way in a top-down fashion trying to control everyone's behavior in the end and I'll tell you more about this uh, in the evening lecture. The second part is about how a complexity scientist would actually go about it. Completely different, bottom up, self organization, you know, that would be the approach. So, and now we're in the middle of a battle between those two paradigms, I should say. You know, the old paradigm is control and. Uh, and it goes so far to control people's thinking emotions with personalized information and trying to control their behavior as much as that can be done. Of course, it doesn't work perfectly, but it works better than you would think. But the point is that even though processing power is increasing exponentially, data volume is increasing even faster such that the percentage of data that you can process is getting smaller and smaller and the percentage of data that you can process is getting larger and larger so there's dark data and that undermines the entire idea of data big data um, the, yeah, the big data paradigm which basically says Oh, if we just have enough data, we don't need theory and science any longer. This shows actually this gap over here that you need to have theory and science in order to decide what data to process and how. Data volume doubles every 12 months now. It means in just a year we're producing as much data as in all the years before in human history. This is unimaginable. But also we go on networking the world and that increases the complexity of those systems in a combinatorial way. That means faster than exponential. And so this basically leads to a situation where the world gets out of control. If you want to control it in a top-down way. I think if you open the newspaper every day, you get the feeling of this is actually happening, right? You have the feeling everything is in good order anywhere on this planet, probably not. But there is a different control paradigm, fortunately, that's distributed control and self-organization based on local interactions and 
that's obviously something that we now have to learn how to build a world based on these principles and run it based on these principles so that basically implies that we have to go away from top-down control to a culture of empowerment away from such a situation where there's so many rules telling everyone what to do in detail towards a situation where we would have systems that help people to do reasonable things so that is about empowerment and now i will go into a number of examples of self-organizing systems to get give you a better idea of um, what is actually going on there i have shown you already this example of the lane formation when pedestrians are walking into opposite directions they will form lanes of uniform walking direction and they're separated from uh, each other and we know this also actually from granular materials that's a graph from Hans Hermann's team as you can see so that's a system with small and large particles which is being shared and as a result you get this size segregation right so there are obviously similarities with granular materials and I'd also like to point out that molecular dynamics is one of the methods uh, that's being applied to simulating pedestrian crowds and force models are also very popular in this area so in particular we came up many years ago with what we call the social force model and here the idea is that people basically have um, a certain kind of predictable behavior so the assumption is that when you're a child you're learning how to walk around other people or avoid collisions and to be efficient and all this and so eventually once this efficient interaction walking has been learned that can be put into mathematical formulas that approximate that behavior and of course there will be deviations but that will be absorbed by a fluctuation term as physicists do that so the, the deterministic part would be described by an equation of motion of course but also an acceleration equation as you can see over here that's the equation for progesterone alpha and what has been assumed here is that there are different motivations of a pedestrian such as walking with a certain desired speed such as avoiding collisions um, keeping some distance from borders or boundaries and let's put into these different force terms and then add it up and that's an assumption of course that uh, we can just superpose such forces and would reasonably approximate uh, people's behaviors and these models have worked uh, surprisingly well i should say so we have a driving force over here that describes an adaptation of the actual velocity to a desired velocity and a desired direction of motion it takes time to adjust we have repulsive interaction between pedestrians we have a repulsive interaction with boundaries so basically if you focus on one pedestrian this pedestrian will be exposed to different kind of forces and they end up and that determines the acceleration of the pedestrian right so this is how it works and yeah if you do this you, you can actually simulate the lane formation phenomenon uh, after some time you will clearly see some lanes forming and this results basically from the relative velocity of people walking to opposite directions so when they meet they have to step a little bit to the side and that creates a separation and finally the most stable pattern will stay which is kind of a pattern with two lanes as you can see it over here right 
And you can do simulations in all sorts of other situations, such as uh, bottlenecks, for example. And here you can find um, self-organized oscillations. It looks like there's a traffic light, but of course there's not. It's a pressure principle that creates these self-organized oscillations. And this will be important later on also for traffic light control. It has inspired a new kind of traffic light control, I should say. And then, actually, when you have two streams crossing each other, something very interesting happens. And probably you wouldn't even find the solution by yourself if you were a pedestrian having to do this. What happens is that there is a phenomenon of stripe formation. And so you walk within a stripe forward and you work sideways within the stripe and in such a way it's possible to walk through this other stream of pedestrian without even stopping this is absolutely amazing you know it's like walking through a wall pedestrians can do this so very fascinating and all of these organized phenomena happen without you even having to figure out complicated math and take difficult strategic decisions just happens as a result of interaction so it really happens by itself but can you get reproduce this phenomenon with continuous this kind of phenomenon i i didn't do it but i think it should be possible yeah. Yeah, I, I guess there's a new PhD thesis out there, <laughs> or master thesis, whatever. And eventually, you know, the models became so popular that they are being used now for the simulation of traffic in transport and logistics, um, multimodal traffic with public transport and pedestrians and. Um, also car traffic and all this mix and it's being used to plan pedestrian facilities um, to evaluate mass events and do all sorts of other things so that's quite nice and you certainly wonder whether there's some similarity with the theory of gases or fluid dynamics. Um, I already mentioned granular materials. Uh, in fact, uh, fluid dynamics plays some role. Unfortunately, there is a particular kind of turbulence occurring in pedestrian cars. So here is the situation that we evaluated based on video recordings of the hatch. And what happened a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2006, as I remember right, there was a terrible accident here at the entrance of the Jamara Bridge, which is 40 meters wide. And the Jamara Bridge, the old one, was 80 meters wide. And that was in the open plaza. So it's hard to imagine that uh, there wouldn't be enough space. But in fact, what happened was there was a merging of different flow directions, and so effectively a bottleneck resulted. And due to the bottleneck, um, there were phenomena that occurred that were quite unexpected. In fact, you couldn't see them when you were just looking into the videos in real time because people were moving so incredibly slowly that you didn't see anything interesting but if you sped up the videos by a factor of 10 20 or 50 or 100 then suddenly you could see some interesting dynamics so for example there was a transition from laminar flow to stop and go flow and we didn't know at that time this would also happen in pedestrian flows because they accelerate very quickly so delays isn't so much of a problem 
are clearly their stop and go waves that we hear, and they occur under certain kind of circumstances that we can now understand. So, the other thing that we noticed was this is an advanced warning sign of a potential upcoming crowd disaster. So, we found this transition from laminar flow to stop and go, stop and go, stop and go flow, but there was this another transition to a further phase which we call crowd turbulence where people are pushed into all sorts of directions and that happens when the density is so large that people are really squeezed in between other bodies and every little shaking of bodies is being transferred to other bodies and forces it up and people are pushed around sometimes for meters and it's very difficult to keep yourself on your feet and that made people fall and it created a terrible crowd disaster where hundreds of people died right so you can see here the shaking in the crowd and that is highly dangerous it didn't end well now, but why do people fall and again we can learn from granular materials um, basically the direction and strength of the forces acting on your body cannot be well anticipated so they're changing all the time, very much as they're changing in these granular systems over here, where you can see the force chains simulated, also work I think by Hans Hermann, yes. And that is kind of a situation that people are exposed to when the densities get very high. So it was clear that after a series of many crowd disasters um, over decades things couldn't stay the way they were and so the old Jamara bridge was torn down completely and replaced by a new Jamara bridge that had much more capacity five levels this time not just two and a segregation of pedestrian flows coming from different directions um, and uh, a lot of additional features to make the Hajj experience much more safe. You should know that um, what happens during the Hajj is that about 3 million people are basically walking by those so-called um, Jamaras that, that, are, that are the pillars, three pillars representing the devil. Exactly speaking, the temptation by the devil. And you know, as a believing Muslim, you're supposed to, to resist the temptation by the devil. And in order to demonstrate that, you're supposed to throw stones at the devil. That means at the pillars. And throws seven small pebbles and those um, pillars and if three million people do that in one day it gets quite crowded right so it's it's really a great challenge to organize that in a safe way so a lot of things have been changed actually including avoiding crossing and counter flows and real-time flow monitoring and adaptive rerouting and contin contingency plans and so on so one could say uh, almost everything was changed in particular that situation over here in 2006 where emergency vehicles basically couldn't reach people in need changed to that situation which was very nicely ordered without places where people could accumulate that was important so basically the capacity along the way was kept the same in order to avoid um, a agglomeration of people and this worked very well and in fact uh, everyone was pretty happy with the outcome as you can see in the faces over here and then in 2015 long after um, I didn't have any involvement yeah, when, when I was young <laughs> much younger than today <laughs> Yes. Uh, so then in 2015, many years later, 
there was an accident, um, and the question is why did that one happen? First of all, again, almost everything has changed over time because um, in 2007 there were just two levels, and then later on there were three and four and five levels, and the entire flow organization had to be changed, and a tunnel for pedestrians was built, and all these kind of things. So the experts responsible for this have basically changed everything. And what happened here is that there were crossing and counter flows. I was organized by a completely different team, as I mentioned. And that, that is actually what caused the, the, the crowd disaster. But the insights into the crowd disaster in 2006 helped us also to understand the love rate disaster. You see here some turbulence, right? And that's the kind of crowd turbulence that again made people fall and uh, that ended up with the deaths of uh, quite a few people and many injured. So you can see actually physics can teach you quite a lot about uh, systems that get out of control, also systems where humans are involved and life and death situations and so yeah physics can help understand problems and can help come up with better solutions. Same thing with uh, freeway traffic, right? So, can we understand traffic flows, you could ask. And so, basically, when you look at this, you would think, oh my God, this really looks very complicated. Uh, and to be honest, if I had seen that in the beginning of my work on traffic, I would probably have chosen another subject. But by that time, it was already too late. So I've done traffic theory, traffic physics for a couple of years. So now I had a reputation to lose, basically. So we had to figure it out, right? It was a matter of honor, basically. And in fact, um, we did figure it out. So we were inspired again by physics. Uh, how do physicists do it? If they have a complicated uh, system, they break it down into smaller problems, um, in particular elementary particles, right? So that's the success principle of physics, breaking things down into small problems that can be understood and then put the system together again. And so we said, couldn't we break down those complicated patterns into small elementary <laughs> traffic patterns? And in fact, we've done that. And a number of uh, patterns that occur many times, such as the off the library congested traffic and the homogeneous congested traffic that happens basically after accidents, the stop and go traffic and then uh, pin localized cluster, moving localized cluster and so on. And in fact, we have simulated those patterns before we had the data. So these are the predictions with very simple traffic flow models, not even distinguishing cars and trucks and other things that uh, would make the model more realistic. But you know, you can see those elementary patterns here in the simulations, all the same model, same parameters even, just the inflows on the freeway and the on-ramp flows, I mean the cars coming added to the freeway are changed. And we can simulate that with various models, microscopic ones, but also microscopic ones, such as this um, intelligent driver model, and there's again an equation of motion, and an acceleration equation, and a certain desired distance that depends on the speed and relative velocity, and it looks a little bit similar to the equation that we saw before for the pedestrian. But of course, it's specifically made uh, for traffic flows. And with this equation, we can simulate those different patterns. And we can even understand when, what kind of patterns would occur. 
and this is being done with a phase diagram, where basically here we have the upstream free wave flow. We here have the bottleneck strength. So let's say if you have an on ramp where people, um, cars are added to the freeway, that's the on ramp flow. That means upstream flow plus on ramp flow is the downstream flow. The overall traffic volume, in other words, and it, this overall traffic volume stays the same along those diagonal lines. So if you increase the overall traffic volume, you obviously go from <coughs> free traffic to stop and go away. It's a homogeneous congested traffic. When you cross certain kind of lines, and these lines can be analytically calculated, right? So it's an analytical theory that makes those predictions when these different patterns occur. And in fact, it is even more interesting than that. There is multi-stability. That means if you have small perturbations, you get a different diagram as compared to when you have large perturbations. So there's history dependence. And in many cases, of course, in empirical data, you cannot say that perturbation was smaller and that one was large. So basically, you have an overlay of the two if you compare it with empirical data, right? And so the question is, would this pattern be found in empirical data? And in fact, we do find this pattern, right? So here you can see a clear separation of faint localized clusters and moving localized clusters that located where they should be, and then stop and go waves and oscillating contrasted traffic up here, and homogeneous contrasted traffic up here. So that's uh, really an uh, astonishing agreement with what was predicted. And the success of the theory goes so far that we can actually predict the extension of traffic jams depending on inflows. And the outflows we know because there's a, it's a constant of traffic flow, it's like a natural constant, like the elementary charge of an electron or the gravitational constant. There are some constants of traffic flow too. Um, they can be understood how they come about through self organization. <coughs> the only thing you cannot predict is when would a perturbation in traffic flow occur. So the onset of congestion has an element of surprise. And then once the suggestion has set in, everything else follows from there. So we can say, even though traffic flow is highly complex, highly nonlinear, there is an analytical theory of traffic flow. So I think that's quite some success. And uh, in fact, if you look into details, most of these congestion patterns are being triggered by perturbation. So if you want to get rid of those traffic jams, then basically you have to homogenize traffic flow. You have to get rid of the large variations in the traffic flow. And you could do that actually with adaptive cruise control systems. So cars are now becoming smarter and smarter, especially with 10 year old stuff. Uh, I have to admit it. Uh, so basically we did that before Google self-driving cars uh, were in the news, right? So, so we're talking about the board data acquisition, perception, integrated communication, cooperative traffic state determination, something like cognition, adaptive choice of the driving strategy, I mean decision making, and all these kind of things. It was being tested with a car company, also in real traffic flows. You know, I was sitting in these cars, driving automatically on the freeway, also in a city. They just couldn't automatically change lanes at that time. And here is a simulation to show you how 
we can use this to get rid of this annoying traffic jam. The stop and go traffic over here is being simulated to show you that we understand the process and the mathematics behind it. Now we can simulate it and once we are fed up with this we will take a, holicap, um, a helicopter <laughs> A helicopter to see what is really going on here and hey here is an odd ramp so some cars want to squeeze themselves on the freeway that produces small <coughs> perturbations and the perturbations are being amplified and that causes the stop and go traffic but we keep the inflow constant but we'll equip those vehicles now with the adaptive cruise control system that means we have a radar center in many of those cars to measure dis distances and relative velocities and let those cars drive automatically in a slightly different way. That means we change the interactions between cars, it's called mechanism design, in such a way that the stability would be increased and the capacity would be slightly increased as well. All of that is being done in a decentralized way based on local interactions, right? And you could see that we can get rid of the traffic jam. The success principle behind this is real-time feed depth. And as I said, mechanism design. And, and then we say, okay, we fix freeway traffic, at least theoretically, the technology could be used anytime political decisions are being made and now let's do urban traffic flow and it says oh, let's reinvent the thing from scratch you know, as physicists like to do it <laughs> and so the idea was rather than trying to control traffic top down through a traffic control center could we come up with new interaction rules such that coordination between vehicles and flows would be improved and that coordination would spread all over the city by self-organization and create much better outcomes. In fact, there's a, a nice movie over here that shows that self-organization can be quite powerful if you have a good design. <laughs> So why is this working over here? Well, <laughs> basically because there's a unidirectional traffic flow over here and unidirectional traffic flow in the back and in between there's a buffer that allows everyone to adjust the speed in such a way that you would find a gap in the traffic flow when you want to cross it. That's a very simple principle and a genus design, right? Of, of course, we would like to, to be a little bit more modern than that, uh, to be honest, but what we did, okay, so if you like it, I'll say it a little bit more. <laughs> it's safe to watch it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is Egypt, by the way. And so what we said is, look, we, we found these oscillatory pedestrian flows as bottlenecks. And it looked like there was a traffic light controlling it. But then we said, okay, our intersections basically also generalize bottlenecks. And couldn't we come up with a similar principle to create oscillatory flows as we had it in the, in the pedestrian flow over here? That means the flow through a generalized pressure principle would come up with their own oscillations in a self-organized way. The traffic flows would control the traffic lights rather than the other way around. Bottom up. Oh, wouldn't need a traffic control center. The question is just how well can it work? Yeah. And let's look at exactly this question. So we'll now compare three kinds of traffic light control in a city. 
So this is what we have today. Centralized traffic control centers that collect as much data as possible from all over the city and then tries to come up with an optimal traffic light control. Unfortunately, there are so many parameters that you can vary at every intersection and then all the intersections combine that you cannot figure out the optimal control scheme in real time. That's impossible, not even for supercomputer. And the hard control problem. So what they basically do is they say, okay, let's uh, come up with an optimal control scheme for typical traffic flow, say Monday morning between 9 and 10, Thursday afternoon between 3 and 4 o'clock, before the football match, after the pop concert, whatever, you know. So you have offline optimal control schedules for those typical situations and you take them out of the folder at those times and even adjust those green times based on measurements. But what you would still do is you would come up with periodic operations during those time windows and you would extend a little bit green times or shorten them but you wouldn't change the order in which you served. You'd also try to synchronize the cycles, right? That means the different intersections. Sounds all very plausible. But what you do is you throw away non-periodic solutions because you think they're probably not very efficient. And the other thing is you have a traffic control scheme which is optimal for a situation that never occurs. In fact, there is so much variability in the traffic flows that standard deviation is a, about as big as the average value, right? Okay, so far on the uh, traffic control center. So they're trying to do the best they can do, but there are limitations, right? They could also say, okay, let's have every intersection decide by itself and strictly minimize travel times of those cars approaching the intersection. You know, it's like homo economicus would do it. Everyone just does the best job they can do. So you'd think, okay, these are selfish decision makers. That can work as well as uh, the centralized traffic light control. So it's actually better than that. And then here, we do the same thing as over here, but when there's a long traffic jam, we would first clear the queue in order to avoid spillover effects at the next upstream intersection. So you're nice to the neighboring intersection you're other regarding before you get back to travel time minimization. So you would think, okay, these friendly guys will do less well as the selfish optimizers over here. And those don't do as well as those intersections that are coordinated by the traffic light control. Right? That's our intuition. Now let's see what ha really happens. For top-down regulation, red curve. What you find is that with increasing capacity, capacity utilization, the queue length is increasing about linear. It uh, makes a lot of sense, right? But then for the, the selfish optimization, a kind of homo economicus approach, you find amazingly shortened queue lengths for small capacity utilizations. But then eventually there is a capacity where basically the entire approach breaks down. Coordination doesn't happen any longer, right? So we, we can say that basically Adam Smith's investable hand works very well over here, but it fails over here. And that's why the traffic control center says, ha ha ha, and this is why you're paying many millions every year for us you know, to run the city, right? But let's have a look at the third approach. And that shows that you can actually be better than the centralized traffic control approach all the way up to the 
maximum capacity utilization if you are friendly to your neighbor, the neighboring intersection. And that is enough apparently to induce some self-organized coordination that spreads all over the network. So we can make the invisible hand work in a decentralized world, way. And you think, okay, maybe they have worked with simple traffic networks. Now let's look into a real messy situation. German city of Dresden, here is the center. And there is an area that they couldn't control to their satisfaction. Even though they bought the state-of-the-art system, they had a competitive procedure to determine the best system in the market, and that's what they used, and it's basically producing coordinated green waves, even adaptive ones. But the point is there are so many public transportation lines, trams and buses and so on, cutting through this area, if they would prioritize those public transportation vehicles, they would disrupt the green waves. And that would cause a monster traffic jam all over the center of the city within a very short time. So they couldn't prioritize public transport even though they wanted to do that. And we could. We just basically said a bus is weighted like 30 vehicles, so they were not strictly prioritized. Maybe they had to wait for three or five seconds, whatever. Um, but as you can see, this is what resulted as compared to the engineered green waves of the state of the art control. This looks much more flexible. It's actually using gaps that happen to be there in the traffic flow, and using it as opportunity, and adapt to those opportunities. And in fact, it turns out that we can dramatically improve public transport, but not even at the cost of individual traffic. The also benefit from that flexibility and it's also good for pedestrians and cyclists and for the environment too. And then you can do the same thing with logistics and supply chains, right? Again, equations, equations, equations for supply networks and you can basically do the entire global production system, the world economy. You know, it's in this matrix over here. You can simulate it. You can look at stability regimes and instabilities and so on and put in actual supply chain data and get those oscillations. I mean, booms and recessions as we experience it. Uh, irregular booms and recessions as we see it actually. And then the question is, would it be possible in principle to get rid of this? And most likely, yes. So we've looked into different organizations of supply chains, like this linear supply chain, this ladder kind of supply chain, this uh, distribution supply chain. You can see some of these produce strong variations as a result to small variations in the demand. But there is one solution which has almost no variation, which is this one, right? And the reason is that there is basically a redundancy in the system. You have two ways of delivering. And in fact, interestingly enough, this is the kind of supply chain that Intel Technologies has learned to use over the years as a supply chain that serves their needs best. What he then did, basically, we were setting up a simulator that was treating a factory in an agent-based way, where each machine had its rules, what it was doing, and also interaction rules with other kinds of machines and elements of that production system. And can 
stick it together in different ways and uh, even apply evolutionary optimization if you want it. And so the idea was also that we would have a system in which the products would talk to the machines, the machines would talk to the products, and the products would talk to the products such as, hey, I'm in a hurry now, let me overtake, and so on. And this can now be done, right? So we, we have RFID chips and so on. So yeah, the self-organized factory can be built, right? So we have come up with a simulator for such uh, self-organized production. And yeah, here is a simulation of a colleague of us that shows how the operation changes with the load of the system. So if there's not much load, then basically each package just takes the shortest route. If there's much load, then you will see a circular flow of those packages in the system, right? So there's a phase transition in that system. Again, self-organized, so very nice from our point of view, right? So these are all the kinds of things that you can do and many more things and then eventually we said, okay, now more and more data becomes available and uh, could be an entire new kind of data science and computational social science and global system science is data that is now increasingly around. We can look into scientific innovations across the world and how memes, in this case, physics concepts spread over time. And we can look into the spreading of culture over thousands of years. There are actually some nice movies on YouTube to watch. And you could look into the spreading of diseases. And as you can see over here, really widely spread data. And it basically says you can't see anything in the data as you watch and how diseases spread in space and time on this planet, which is frustrating. But this is because of all the travel of people who spread the diseases, right? They mess up the diffusion process, basically. And what we then did, Dirk Brockman and I, we came up with an effective distance considering proximity based on traffic volumes, air tra travel volumes. And if you do that, basically you get a linear relationship that then produce a very intuitive spreading dynamics, which is a circular spreading process in this effective distance network. Yes, and in this way you can determine the origin of the disease and the city where it started. You can predict what are the next cities to be hit by the flu. You can put medicine in these cities and medical personnel you can prepare better. And all of that can be done if you combine different kinds of data sources with some theoretical consideration as we've done it in that science paper. So now I told you the biggest problem, however, is sustainability. Our economy is just not sustainable. You know, we need to fix this. This is a life and death question. Now, believe it or not, billions of people's lives depend on this one question. And so it would be great, of course, if we could build an economy that's self-organized and fulfills our requirements, right? And I do think that now we can build it with the Internet of Things. That means local measurements everywhere, local. You know, we don't have to collect all the data in one database. And so 300 years after Adam Smith's idea of the invisible hand, I think we can make it work. So basically, now this idea is to create an information platform that would allow for real-time measurement and real-time feedback in such a way that we could 
manage complex systems and even build self-organizing complex systems everywhere in the world based on local interaction. Yeah. That's the simple thing that we have to do now. Yeah. And we start, of course, very small, and the project is called NervousNet, and the idea is that you know, if the government doesn't build it for us and Google doesn't build it for us, let's build it ourselves. And we even have the tools in our pockets, which is our smartphone. You know, it has many sensors in it. We can use those sensors to measure the environment. We could build a global measurement system. You and me and everyone else. You know, we could run that system ourselves. We could measure noise and CO2 and stress and externalities of all kinds and waste and all those things that we would like to reduce and we could measure those things that we'd like to spread such as health and education and reuse of resources and reuse of waste and all that. We just need to have a real-time feedback system that means a real-time Incentive system, multi-dimensional, not one-dimensional as our money system. You know. That's a thousands of years old, totally outdated control system. You know. We need to have a multi-dimensional coordination system. And physicists can build it. So what are you waiting for? You know. So we could do it with blockchain, for example, also differently if you like, but in principle, the point is to combine Internet of Things measurement with evaluation and incentive system, multidimensional, and in this way you can make the reuse of waste attractive. You can make ecological production rewarding. You can incentivize socially responsible production. You can build in the values of our society into this new kind of financial system, which maybe is not even anymore a financial system, it's just a coordination system. And in this way, create new market forces that would create a circular and sharing economy eventually by itself through those incentives that there would be built into the system. You can do that. Uh, we can support social self-organization. We know it's efficient if we have the right kind of interactions between people, right? So in order to get there, we would need to have something like an adaptive cruise control system for social interactions, right? Which is basically digital assistance that shouldn't be controlled by Google or Facebook or by the government, it should be controlled by us, of course, right? We should be able to turn it on or off. We should be able to set the goal. We should have options. We should be able to choose and then the system should help us to achieve our goals in the optimal way, right? And so you can come up with digital assistance that would help you overcome cultural barriers such as real-time translation and all sorts of other digital assistance that would help you identify opportunities that you would otherwise miss, warn you of exploitation or damage, help you to set up interactions favorably and organize projects to do in this world what you want to happen. We could build devices that help us overcome conflict, devices that change the incentive structure, that change the game from a conflict situation into a situation where we would find shared norms, for example, or we could come up with feedback mechanisms that would support the emergence of cooperation. In this way, overcome tragedies of the commons. And there are, in fact, a number of decentralized mechanisms to promote cooperation, social order. And this includes 
genetic favoritism, which, however, um, is age old and not the best we can do. There's better mechanisms, such as direct reciprocity or peer punishment or indirect rep reciprocity, which is uh, reputation. And the question is, would we have to punish people if they don't do what uh, they should be doing, or are there maybe even superior approaches, such as signaling, and giving people the right kind of information? And in fact, it turns out that there is a kind of signaling that outperforms this cost to punishment. And there are mechanisms such as matching those people who are more cooperative with other cooperative people, which incentivizes to be cooperated because they would have better outcomes. And there are mechanisms such as success-driven migration. So here you can see that basically red is spreading, which means non-cooperative behavior, blue is disappearing, but that is all based on imitation of the strategy of the best performing neighbor and some randomness that we have added to the system. If we also add success driven migration, it means the choice of the best place in a certain radius around you, you would get just the opposite. That means non cooperative behavior throughout the world would eventually be replaced by cooperation. So after many iterations, what happens is there would be a cluster of cooperative people and that makes cooperation rewarding. And as this is rewarding, it's being copied by other people. And as you can see, cooperation starts spreading and it will spread all over the world. This is pretty amazing, but a physicist would understand it because there is some similarity with the nucleation effect, right? So again, physics thinking helps. And of course, and then social scientists and economists would say, Okay, so these are little funny simulations in your computer, but does it happen in reality? Ask, for example, Ernst Fair, he's very close to the Nobel Prize. And so he couldn't believe it, and that's why we made uh, experiments with uh, two of his team members, um, Sonia Fook and Charles Efferson, and they also didn't believe it. But then what we found is this. Payoff actually increases with mobility. Mobility is key to success. Right? It's not the only key, but um, it's one of the keys. <coughs> and then there's, as I said, um, indirect reciprocity, I mean, reputation systems, and uh, qualification systems that could build into the system. So basically, there are many ways how you can create decentralized feedbacks that would change the interactions, change the game to promote cooperation and the situation where people don't battle with each other. So I'm coming towards the end with the question, why are we social? I mean, being social is really the key to success the social animals and people that are the most successful. Right? Take ads, for example, in terms of biomass, they're as successful as people. Now, economists always say, if we weren't selfish, we couldn't survive. So the argument is basically, if I'm nice to you and I give something to you, this creates advantages for you, and you will have more offsprings or children, and I will have less. And that's why the friendly people will eventually die out. And we will stay with selfish people on this planet. 
And I could never believe this argument and say, oh, okay, let's make a computer simulation. And the uh, rules of the computer simulations are like this. Agents decide, according to a best response rule, that strictly mini, uh, maximizes their utility function, as economists would assume, given the behaviors of the interaction partners. And the utility function considers not only the own payoff, but gives a certain way to the payoff of their interaction partners. The way is called friendliness, but it's set to zero for everyone at the beginning of the simulation. It means in the beginning, everyone is selfish, like hell. And friendliness is a trait that's uh, inherited to offspring. The likelihood to have an offspring increases, uh, increases exclusively, however, with the own payoff, not utility. Now, uh, if you have to feed them, it really depends on how much income you have and how much food you can buy, right? So the payoff is assumed to be zero when a friendly agent is exploited by all neighbors. Such agents will never have children in that computer simulation, right? And then finally, the inherited friendliness, well, it tends to be that of the parent, but there is also a certain limitation rate, but it's chosen in a way that it doesn't promote friendliness. So what happens? Well, economies are right for most of the parameter space, right? Homo economicus, the selfish decision maker, results for most parameter combinations. But they are not always right. And in particular, they're wrong for the situation that matters most for human beings. Of course, what we see over here is other regarding behaviors, but in this corner, where offspring are raised in the neighborhood of parents, as we do it as humans, right? We don't put them somewhere, our children, we raise them with us. Right? That, that is important. That is a precondition, actually, for other regarding preferences, not just behavior preferences, other regarding preferences to spend. And you see over here that even now everyone starts selfish like hell after so and so many generations, there will be a distribution of friendliness. And this is what you find in reality. There are some super selfish people, but most people have some pro-social preferences, in fact, to different degrees. But anyway, so that makes us social and that makes us successful as a species. And so I close by saying these are the success principles for a complex world. Co-learning, co-creation, combinatorial innovation, coordination, cooperation, co-evolution, and collective intelligence. And I'm closing with a computer simulation of two populations. They're strangers, basically. And they all start selfish. And the question is, will they learn to behave cooperative? Will they become other regarded? And will they, will they cooperate with strangers? Well, they learn to love each other in other words. So that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh -huh. So, so far they're still pretty selfish. But then, you know, the blue and the green islands appear, green disappears again, blue and red. So, yeah, and now things get mixed eventually. and. Well, the green is back, green is now on this side, surprisingly blue has disappeared, it's coming back now, blue and green is mixed, and blue and green is spreading, so, well, looks like a happy end, the question is just you know, when, when it's going to, to be. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much, it was a great talk. Question. Uh, two, one, uh, you, can you show
show back again that uh, globe of uh, flags. We did show a picture that there is a globe full of flags ah. in different countries. Did I? Did, yes. The globe. The globe. And flight of the world and a... Uh, oh, the flight. Yeah. The flight. Yeah. 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 Here? No. This is the center of the... Yeah. That one. This is the whole This? Yeah. No. Below. You know. Here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Did you make this picture yourself or why did you get this? <laughs> because I noticed that Brazil is right in the middle. <laughs> right above the middle and next to the United States. Yes. Yeah. It's as, as important as the United States and very important in Japan there. Yeah, what does it tell us? Uh, well, I think it wasn't. You could just ask for the episode. It wasn't yeah. British. Yeah. The British? Yeah. The British? Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. 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 So, so they will never put the uh, night speech in the center. <laughs> 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 it was just before the, the World Cup. I, I haven't watched it carefully, so uh, I'm not sure it looks the same when I speak in another country. <laughs> 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 well, you know, it's a different country. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we need to be concerned. You know, we'll see this in my evening talk. The situation our societies are in is highly dangerous, and that's why I'm proposing a different approach over here. Right? I'm also not publishing about certain kinds of things because I'm afraid it would be used in military ways to destabilize countries and to do all sorts of bad things. So until we've managed to get into a reasonably peaceful state on this planet, I think we have to be careful to spread all the knowledge that we have. <laughs> so a politician might not like you at all. I don't know if you are very, you would be very happy or you would be. Hello, good boost of show. I didn't lose it. So the second question is more technical. It's the one about uh, the spreading of epidemics. So could you, you just do a little bit more detail on the way you translate the actual network and some metrics, what kind of techniques you use to do this? Uh, ah, yeah, the, there's a... Uh, this effective uh, distance function that uh, has a logarithm in it and has uh, basically traffic, uh, tra traffic volumes in it. And uh, it's a pretty simple formula in the first approximation. And you can read it in the science paper. Roberto, I have to come back to the first question. It's about a, a question about uh, ants. Do the ants... Uh, happen to create gems or the, the lines they, they walk all smoothly all the time? Very good question. <laughs> Who sings ants produce traffic jams? Raise your hands. Who sings ants are smart enough to avoid traffic jams that humans built? Wow. <laughs> so you trust in evolution, right? And in fact, uh, I was involved in a nature publication about this question. And it turns out ants are able to avoid traffic jams if they're kind of alternative. So we were looking at a setup where we had a nest and a food source and a bridge connecting the two, with a bridge with two branches. And usually ants just take one branch, the shortest branch basically. But if it's too narrow to transport all the traffic between nest and food source and the other way around, they would start using the other branch, even if that's longer. And it would start before traffic jams occur. So they have a very simple interaction rule that we also figured out that allows them to sense basically the, the time when they need to engage in an uh, additional group. That's quite interesting. Yeah, another question. Is it somehow related to uh, grass paradox? Is this, I mean, in order to, uh, what to create a bird uh, path, do you think the longer one? I don't see the immediate connection, but uh, maybe there is one. Certainly the brass paradox is a very interesting question to look into. Is this, I, I would think it has somehow to do with the suboptimal solutions such as the tragedy of the commons that I was talking about. Right? <coughs> so for those who haven't heard about it, this is about a situation where adding a road could deteriorate actually travel times in the system. Mm -hmm. So, any further questions? Yes. Uh, yes. The picture you did show about friendliness and cooperation, it looks quite nice, like what happened in the world during in the European time in the Middle Ages, that you did not have any centralized government. And they always compare with China, where the government was pretty much centralized, and they stopped too many developments to happen. And because Europe was completely uncentralized, and so if one did not use the best interaction rules, they would change to another country, very close by. And then that one developed, and then people start to copy. It looks like 
And that is, the, that, that is the danger of the approach that some people call the world government. You know, that we're basically, this very same rule would be decided for the entire planet and implemented everywhere. So kind of diversity would get lost, competition would get lost, alternatives would get lost. Uh, there is a danger that we would run into such a system now, faced with those challenges such as global warming and uh, potential resource shortages and so on. But uh, as you kind of seem to suggest, that will be terrible because diversity is really the basis of innovation, of resilience, of collective intelligence, of we really have to make sure we're not losing it, right? If we're talking about the best chances for survival, for as many people as possible, we need to have a resilient society, and that requires diversity. Good question. Okay. It's about the economics. So uh, what do you think about the uh, B2B payment system, like phone, blockchain? It's uh, not a self-organizing. I, I think it's an I interesting technology. I s also think we might see a number of evolutionary steps of that technology before it really um, does what uh, we need it to do. It's still not multidimensional as it should be when I was talking about this multidimensional coordination system. But I think if used well, that could really enhance our opportunities, but it could also be used to create a totalitarian system. Suppose that all the transactions that we do will be done through blockchain or DAOs, you know, distributed uh, autonomous organization. And so before you can use a rental car or order a Uber or something, you'd have to pay the rent for your apartment. If you are late with the rent of your apartment, you basically get nothing. You know, you could have such a system too. You could have a system where you cannot even view, even less download a picture from the internet if you haven't paid before. You could even think of a system where you have to pay for the words that you want to use when writing a sentence or when speaking to somebody else, right? So first pay before you, <laughs> otherwise shut up, you know, that could be a system that could also be realized with blockchain. So blockchain as every technology is not good in itself. It opens up new opportunities, but it also has potential side effects. And the very same thing applies, of course, to artificial intelligence and big data and every single technology that we have. But yes, let's use the good part of it and try to avoid the bad part. Yeah. So the question, well, I have one question and maybe... No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was really afraid that would happen. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it true, Colleen, that a system which is a distributed and not local is more, gives more personal freedom than a system which is centralized. I mean, just think about my Swiss neighbors, which is a local control, but it's a very heavy control on my life, much more than I, the government, which is far away. Yeah? So, I mean, this is a system which not necessarily is going to be better for people's personal freedom of individuals. But that's a society that has kind of the distributed punishment, right? That's right. This, this, uh, Swiss society is exactly what you're looking for. Where the interactions? <laughs> there is, there is some good and some bad side, of course, that for every society. But what I said is, there are better systems than, than peer punishment. You know, that, that altruistic signaling was actually superior. And so, let's go just for the best implementations of societies. And uh, as I said, on the other hand, you know, we need some variety because there's no final solution for the best society ever. It's an evolutionary process and we need to experiment, we need to learn from each other, we need to help each other to master the challenges that we're confronted with. And, um, I think we need to get that started.
Great. So with this, uh, I think again, it was a heavy for his talk.